Hello, everybody, shalom. I want to welcome you again to another installment of the Urban International Ministries teaching series. It's been a while since I've been with you guys, but I'm so happy to be back. Uh, since the last time, my wife and I took a couple of trips back to the States to see our kids and to uh, have a little bit of a procedure on my eyes, uh, cataract surgery, and I, I can see things very good now. Everything's high definition for me, so praise God for that. Okay, guys, today I want to be, I'm going to be teaching on the topic of God's plans versus our plans. And again, this is based on some thoughts that I have from the series entitled Experience of God. And as always, when I stand before you, I hope that something is said that will help you on your journey to fulfilling your God-ordained journey as you sojourn here on this earth. But before we get into today's teaching, let's go to God in prayer, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, in the name of your Holy Son, Yeshua, we are so grateful for this privilege and opportunity to stand before you and the people to present this what I believe you have given to me. Lord, I pray for everybody listening that uh, they won't hear me, but they'll hear you through me, the Holy Spirit through me. Lord, we are uh, so grateful to you as our Heavenly Father. We praise you, we honor you, and we worship you. Satan, we come against you in the name of Yeshua, and we bind you up from this meeting, and whatever we bind on this earth is bound in heaven. So you and your kingdom is hereby dismissed from this teaching. Take your hands off the technology. Take your hands off the lives of the people listening. And we ask these blessings in the name of Yeshua. Amen. All right. God's plans versus our plans. Who delivered the children of Israel from Egypt? Was it Moses or was it God? Kind of a silly question, but of course God did. <clears throat> God chose to bring Moses into a, a relationship with himself so that he, God, could deliver Israel, not Moses. So did Moses ever take matters into his own hands? And uh, the answer to that was yes. If you go back to Exodus chapter 2, and let's read chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Here's an example of Moses taking things into his own hands, his own plans. Verse 11, and it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. Um, and he said to him that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, who gave thee a prince and judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard of this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and he dwelt in the land of Midian and he sat down by a well. So here's an example of Moses when he asserted himself on the behalf of his own people. What do you think might have happened, guys, if Moses tried to deliver the children of Israel through, uh, from Egypt through human means? Well, maybe, just maybe, thousands upon thousands of people would have been slain. So Moses, again, had a history of trying to take matters into his own hands, and the results of which were not so great. In the example we just went over, it cost him 40 years of exile in Midian, working as a shepherd. But I might add that 40 years of exile helped him reorient his life to a God-centered focus, not a self-centered focus, but a God-centered focus. When God delivered the children of Israel, how many were lost? None. And God's way of handling things, God even led the Egyptians to give the Israelites their gold, their silver, and their clothes. Egypt was plundered. The Egyptian army was destroyed, and Israel did not lose a single person. So why do we not realize that it is always best to do things God's way? We cause some of the wreck and ruin in our own lives and in our own ministries because we have a plan. We implement those plans and we get out of it only what we can get out of it. 
Brothers and sisters, if we just discover the difference when we let God be the head of our bodies, God be the head of our minds, and God be the head of our spirits, as well as our ministries, he will accomplish more in six months through a people yielded to him than we could in 60 years without him. Think about that. Let's go through this short exercise. I want everybody to flip over to Psalms 81. And we're going to do verses 10 through 12. Psalms 81, 10 through 12. And it reads, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up to their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. And I want to ask you four questions, guys, based on these three verses. What had God already done for Israel? Well, in verse 10, it says he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Pretty simple. Number two, what did God promise to his people? That's also in verse 10. He would fill their mouths if they opened wide, if they opened them wide to him. In other words, he would meet their needs in abundance. Number three. How did the people respond? Verse 11 says, they would not hearken to God's voice. And the last question, so what did God do? And that's in verse 12. He gave them up to their own heart's lust and he let them do things their own way. Now look at the next two verses. Saying, saying 81 Psalms, let's look at 13 and 14. All that my people had hearkened unto me and Israel had walked in my ways, not their ways, God's ways. And I soon have to, I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. So if Israel had followed God, he would have annihilated their enemies and their adversaries. Listen to this. We adjust our lives to God so that he can do through us what he wants to do. God is not our servant to make adjustments to our plans. We are his servants, and we adjust our lives to what he is about to do. If we will not submit, God will let us follow our own devices. Now, if we choose to do what we think is the better path and not follow God, we will never experience what God is waiting and wanting to do on our behalf or through us for others. It's all about what God wants to do. You already know that. Israel was brought out of Egypt by miraculous signs and wonders. Would you not think having been a witness to that, that they could trust God to do anything? They saw those things God did in Egypt, but they must have had a short memory. But as we know, uh, they when they got to the promised land, they got scared of the giants in the land and they feared them uh, because they didn't think they, they could overcome them. The gift of God awaited, awaited them, something God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants, which included them. The promise was about to be realized uh, and the God that defeated Pharaoh apparently was not big enough to defeat the giants in the land. So what did they do? You know what they did. They listened to the 10 spies that brought the evil report. They didn't listen to Joshua and Caleb who brought the good report and as a result, of their own plan, mm -hmm. they spent an extra 40 years wandering in the wilderness because they had an another idea, another way of doing it. So as we read in Psalms 91, God reminded Israel that he would have annihilated and quickly conquered their enemies if they had just followed his plan. I want to read that same uh, Two verses, Psalms 81, 13 and 14, but I want to read it out of the Amplified Bible. And it reads, 13, oh, that my people would have listened to me, that Israel would walk in my ways speedily, then I would have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. He had already promised them that. The giants in the land was nothing. He would have annihilated them through them if they had just had faith and did it God's way. When we get our own thinking in the way of God's plans, his word, we're going to screw up, guys. We're going to screw up. Sometimes when you're following God's word and you're 
broken by faith and not by sight, and things don't happen quick or on our time schedule, and we go about doing things our way, we're going to wind up getting ourselves in big trouble with God. Do it God's way. Always do it God's way. Walk by faith, not by sight. Think about this question. Would you rather follow your own plans and wander around in a spiritual wickedness or follow God's plans, God's ways, and quickly enter into a spiritual promised land? I want to ask that again. Would you rather follow your own plans or wander around in a spiritual wickedness or follow God's ways? It doesn't matter how long it takes. And I'm not telling you this stuff is easy because it's hard. I've been through things. You guys know my story. I went through cancer and it wasn't happening quick enough for me. It took me eight years, guys, eight years before I got, medically speaking, to the point where I was cancer free, but I got it. I got it. It may not come when you want it, but it's going to come right on time. That's that old, that old song. So would you rather follow your own plans and wander around in the spiritual wilderness or follow God's plans and quickly enter into a spiritual promised land? It's a no brainer, right? Let's shift gears and talk about this. We need to know what God is about to do. When God called the prophets, he often had a twofold message. The first message was the desire of God, and the desire of God was to call the people to return to him. So apparently they were doing things their own way, and he warned them to come back. But if the people failed to respond, then the second message was they needed to hear what was going to happen because of that decision. That was the role of the prophets. The first desire of God was to call the people to return to him, but if they didn't, then they needed to hear the second message. Here's an example. In Ezekiel 5, 7, God told Israel because of their consistent disobedience in keeping his laws and ordinances, okay, because they wanted to do things their way. God warned them. His desire was them to stop doing what they were doing come back, return to him, and keep his laws and ordinances. But because they consistently didn't do it, in Ezekiel 7, verses 7 and 8, he told them, let them know that they're closer to the moment of judgment than they have ever been. So the prophet did just what we said. The first desire was for the children of Israel to come back, keep his laws and ways. But if they didn't, this is what's going to happen. They were warned. That's just one example. Ultimately, God's word to the prophets was this. He had four steps for the prophets. Number one, this is what I have been doing. This is what God has been doing. Number two, this is what God is doing right now. Number three, this is what God is about to do. And number four, then tell the people to respond. Number one, this is what I have been doing. Number two, this is what I'm doing right now. Number three, this is what I'm about to do and give them a chance to respond. It was very important that the prophets understood what God was about to do. Anytime God decided to bring judgment, it was vitally important that the prophets knew what was going to happen so they could warn the people of God about it. Warn the people as God directed them. I want to read Isaiah 5, 1 through 7, and this is from the Amplified Bible. This is the story of the vineyard. Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. Now, let me sing for my greatly beloved, which is the Lord, a song of my beloved about his vineyard, and the vineyard is his chosen people. My greatly beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile slope, and that very fertile slope, guys, was the promised land, Canaan. Verse 2. He dug it all around and he cleared away its stones and planted it with uh, the choicest vine, which are the people of Judah. And he built a tower in the center of it. He also hewed out a, vine, a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce the choicest of grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. And now says the Lord, oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, just between me and my vineyard, this vineyard or his people, what more could I have done for my vineyard than I have not done in it? 
when I expected it to produce good grapes? Why did it yield worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I'm gonna do to my vineyard. I will take away its thorn hedge and it will be burned up. I will break down the stone wall and it will be trampled down by your enemies. I will turn it into a wasteland. I, it will not be pruned or cultivated, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also command the clouds not to rain on it. And then lastly, verse seven, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house, the nation of Israel and the men of Judah are his delightful planting, which he loves. So he looked for justice, but in fact, he saw bloodshed and lawlessness. They weren't keeping the laws. He looked for righteousness, but in fact, he heard a cry of distress and oppression. So let's stop there. So the Lord is telling us that judgment had already started across the world. And in verse six, it says again, I will turn it into a wasteland. It will not be pruned or cultivated, but briars and thorns will come up. And I will also command the clouds not to rain on it. Hmm. You know, our old prophet had been warning God's people for a long time that this time was coming. Guys, it's not just coming. We're in it right now. Judgment has already started across this planet. Key thought, understanding what God is about to do where you are is far more important than you telling God what you want to do for him. I'm going to say it again. Understanding what God is about to do where you are is far more important than you telling God what you want to do for him. What good would it have been for Abraham to tell God that he was planning to take a survey of Sodom and Gomorrah and go door to door witnessing the day before he was about to destroy the cities? What good would it, would it do for you to make long-term plans in your area where you live or your ministry even, if before you even get started to implement that, God brought judgment upon the nation? You need to know what God has on his agenda for your ministry, for your community, for your nation, for your life at this time in history, then you can adjust your life to him, to God, so he can move you into the mainstream of his activity before it's too late. Though God would not likely give us a detailed plan, he never gives us a detailed plan. He will tell you what the next step is, one step at a time. And you or your ministry need to respond to what he's doing. This is God's thing. What we pray all the time in the Lord's Prayer, let thy will be done on earth, not ours, right? So in your community where you live right now, there are some things that are about to happen in the lives of others. God wants to intercept those lives and get you involved in doing it. There is an obvious need to always seek and share the salvation message with others. That's always. And now as covenant keepers, there is a desperate need to plant seeds of understanding about the need to keep God's commandments, his laws, not to be saved, but because we are saved. Or maybe it's your time to move to another location. I don't know what God's got going on in your life, but you need to seek him. You need to seek him. Pray fast, whatever you have to do, and ask God, where, where are you? Where are you working? How can I join you so I can, I can be an instrument in your hands to accomplish your will in my life, through my life, excuse me, where I am right now, i.e., I can fulfill my destiny here on this earth by having God work through me to get his job done, what he wants to get done. Suppose God wants to do through you, do something through you. He comes to you and he talks to you about it, but you might respond that you're afraid or you're not well trained or how do I do such things or, 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 or you fill in the blank. Looking at the inadequacies of myself or yourself is being self-centered. Did you hear me? When you look at what you can't do for God, you're looking at your weaknesses and you're not looking at the divine God who can do all things through you. Do you see what's happening? The focus is on me, myself, and I. 
The moment you sense that God is moving in your life, you give him a whole laundry list of reasons why, why he picked the wrong person or why the timing isn't right, right? That's what Moses did, right, back in uh, Exodus. Exodus 3.11, and Moses said it to God. He's talking to God. <laughs> He's telling God, who am I that I should go into Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of the Israel out of Egypt? And he said the same thing in Exodus 4.1. And Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, but they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto me. And on and on, I can't speak right. I can't do that. I can't yang, 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 yang. Everybody, I wish we would see God's perspective. He knows that none of us have the wherewithal to do the things he invites us to do, to join him in what he's doing or, or going to do, but he wants to do them himself through us, through us. We're just pawns. We're instruments in his hand to accomplish his will. Do it his way. Let's accomplish his plans. Okay, let's summarize. Let's just do things God's way. God will accomplish more in six months through a people yielded to him than we could do in 60 years without him. Next point, you and I are God's servants. God is not our servant. Adjust our lives to what he is about to do. And lastly, understanding what God is about to do where you are is far more important than you and I telling God about our plans and what we want to do for him. He doesn't really care what you want to do for him. He has an agenda. Let's get on board with his plan. Let's be instruments in his hands so he can accomplish his will through us where we are right now. And guys, the byproduct of that is that we will reach our destiny because we're here to do his work through us. Amen? Amen. Hope you got something out of this short lesson. May God be with you and bless you and keep you until we meet again. Shabbat shalom and goodbye.